Welcome back to Face the Nation. For some insight into yet another busy week, we turn to our political panel. Susan Page is the Washington Bureau Chief for USA Today. David Ignatius is a columnist for the Washington Post. We also welcome Michael Graham to the broadcast. He is a, he is a contributor to the Weekly Standard. And Peter Baker is chief White House correspondent for the New York Times. Michael, I'll start with you. Let's start with, uh, not just because your name is Michael, but we'll start with <laughs> Michael Flynn. Um, Michael Flynn said he wanted protection from these various investigations going into connections between the Russian intervention in the election and the Trump campaign. And of course, the president's critics think this is a big deal. Where do you see it? Uh, well, I think it's a big deal for Michael Flynn, because now that we have these new revelations about the money he was taking from other international sources and talk about kidnapping someone, in the United I mean, it's like a bad you know, B action movie. He has a lot of, I think, risk for himself that could have absolutely nothing to do with the Russian investigation. You know, it could be that the best thing that could have happened for Trump would be to get Mike Flynn out early, you know, in this first move on this investigation and then see where it goes from there. David, uh, but if you wanted to talk to one person with respect to this question of if there was a connection, you'd want to talk to Michael Flynn. I think Michael Flynn is, is, a, is a crucial uh, witness on the question of what the Russians were doing. Uh, Michael Flynn is the person who can answer the question, what did Donald Trump know about the conversations with Ambassador Kislyak about the, the sudden uh, change in Russian policy to avoid retaliation for the sanctions uh, imposed by Obama. The person who knows whether that was discussed with Donald Trump, what Donald Trump said, whether he approved it, uh, is Michael Flynn. So I think for, the, for that it's really important. That's not an issue necessarily that involves violations of law, but it goes right to the heart of this question of the Trump administration and Russia. And Susan, the president came out and said, great for Michael Flynn to get uh, to ask for protection. Obviously, then the, there was a lot of going back to the campaign in which the president said, if you're asking for immunity, it means you've done something wrong. What does this mean for the White House? This cannot be good news for the White House. The words you don't want to hear from a former senior aide is, I have a story to tell and I would like immunity to tell it. <laughs> right. Because the way you get immunity is if you have somebody more important that you can offer evidence on. If, if the story ends with Michael Flynn, he's not going to get, we, we assume he would find it a difficult task to get immunity. This is a classic progression in a Washington investigation. You've got allegations, you get denials, you start an investigation. People get named and feel threatened. They seek immunity. They want to tell their story. And you start, it's like you, you pull the thread of a sweater and suddenly the sweater's unraveling. That's the risk for this White House. And this, you know, a year from now, we'll still be talking about this on the Face of Nation Roundtable. This is going to be around a cloud over the White House for months and more. Peter, it's true the investigations are going on for some time. Senator Cornyn suggested this is a long process. The FBI has said they're going to be doing this for a long time. On this uh, question of, of um, of Michael Flynn, it, what does this tell us, if anything, about the about President Trump? In the sense that we've now learned a lot of things about Michael Flynn, his connection to the to the Turks, uh, connections to our, uh, the Russia Today, um, uh, none of which we knew before. He was the president's top national security advisor. Yeah, no, it's rather extraordinary. Of course, he was not uh, national security advisor during the campaign, but he was advising the campaign during this. We just saw in the latest financial disclosures put out on Friday that he failed in the first draft he sent in to disclose uh, these payments that some of these Russian-linked entities had made to him that was later corrected. Um, it's, an, you know, 24 days he spent as national security advisor have now turned into months of nightmare for this White House for the very reason Susan just talked about, because they know what he knows, they think they know what he knows, but maybe they don't know what he knows. And if he has a story to tell, it's not one that they want to hear. Susan, speaking of knowing what we know and what we don't know, and who knows it and where do they know it, let's switch the question of House <laughs> Chairman Devin Nunes. Um, there was a lot of going on this week. Can you, ha um, where, where, what do you make of the House Intelligence Chairman's serious allegation about what the Obama administration may have done, but also then the way it unfolded this week? Well, it unfolded like a clown car kind of thing. I mean, it was uh, really quite extraordinary. He's in Uber, he gets out of the Uber, he goes to the White House, he misrepresents who tells him this information. He then comes back to brief the president, who we can only assume already knew the information because it's his people who told the, the chairman. I think the end result is it has really uh, undermined the credibility of the House Intelligence Chairman to move ahead on this. It's hard to see how he rebuilds that. And it increases, it seems to me, the possibility that the Senate Intelligence Committee does a serious investigation in a bipartisan way because they do not want to look like the House Committee looked this week. 
Michael, what do you make of, uh, again, a serious charge that mm -hmm. the chairman has made? Has he, has he hurt himself by the way it played out? Um, his, his defenders say he had to go to the White House because of the kind of intelligence it was and so forth. Uh, what, what do you make of it? Well, I make of it as similar to the Mike Flynn problems, which is that you have tactics and then you have policy and then you have politics. The fact is, and this is something I think the media have widely kind of lost focus on. There are documents in all of these stories. There is a tape of Mike Flynn talking about something. There, there's a stack of papers that N Nunes and now Schiff have seen. Right. And eventually that information is going to come out and it's either going to be damning or it's going to be exculpatory. It's going to be something. But for him to do, wait, mm -hmm. what's the problem with me talking to Trump before I talk about, what, is that a bad thing? I mean, wait, are, I'm sorry, are you new to politics? Is this your first week? That, that's, that's the problem. It's all political. I think, however, in the end, the facts will dominate this story. And that's what we're waiting for is some facts. Well, which is, go ahead, Peter. Well, so the other thing is that what he's talking about is not the same thing as President Trump said in his tweet. Right. The White House is seizing on this information to suggest that that justifies the president accusing his predecessor of wiretapping him, which mm. is still not in any way uh, in evidence. What Chairman Nunes was talking about was this, the surveillance of foreign officials, which is something we have done forever. David knows better than anybody. But at, in, in, in the process of that, we picked up American officials. Did they minimize? Did they unmask? These are interesting questions, but they don't go to the original question, which is, did President Obama wiretap his successor? Here's what's extraordinary. The White House has just spent a month, a precious early right. month, trying to find evidence for a tweet that the president sent. They have not found the evidence. Mitch McConnell asked just this morning, said no. He's seen no evidence that the, that the Obama administration wiretapped Trump Tower, and yet the White House has been consumed by this at terrific cost to other things they'd like to do. It was interesting to see her, her Ambassador Haley say, well, it's just Washington <laughs> chatter, but they have spent a month uh, trying to deal with that chatter. David, would you put into context this question of unmasking for us, since you do know this so well? What do we keep our eye on uh, in terms of trying to figure out? So under existing uh, surveillance orders, uh, the United States is listening to all kinds of diplomats, uh, intelligence officials uh, around the world under various authorities. And when that collection picks up, incidentally, the names of Americans, uh, Joe Russia happens to be calling Joe America. Uh, Joe America's name is typically minimized. It, it's it's mass so that uh, that person's privacy is, is protected. In in certain circumstances where it's necessary to understand who the conversation was between, uh, the name is unmasked. And then if, if there's a, a legal investigation beyond that, there there, there are even more reasons. What's uh, happened this month? is that what initially seemed a preposterous argument by Donald Trump, that he had been wiretapped by uh, President Obama illegally, has morphed into an argument about privacy, about proper masking techniques, a very technical legal issue, uh, and is now accepted, I think, as part of the mainstream uh, set of uh, issues that are going to be d debated by the two intelligence committees. And, and from, from Trump's standpoint, that's, I, I think you'd have to say that that's a success. It may be a pyrrhic victory for Nunez, whose who's credibility, ability to lead the committees, radically compromised, but that's now in the center stage. But there's a meta story here, which is that the people who rally around Trump, when I was doing talk radio, my listeners, they feel like they can't get a, a break and that they're under attack. And this is Trump under attack. And, the, you know, uh, we work with Selena Zito, where I work at Washington Examiner as well, and she coined the phrase, you know, the press takes Trump literally but not seriously. His supporters take him seriously but not literally. And they, they, this feeds their notion that you can't get a fair break. They watched what happened with Hillary Clinton, and they feel like you never pushed as hard when the woman had classified information, literally on a computer in her basement, and you couldn't get serious with that. Now, here you are nitpicking about was it spying or was it inappropriate leaking, and that story... I don't know that it's a winner for Trump, but like you said, for right now, that's feed, his base is feeding off of that. Mixing the two together right. probably does feel like a winner. We're going to take a break here quickly. We'll be right back with more of our panel. Stay with us. And we're back with our panel. Peter, I want to start with you uh, on the question of President Trump this week, um, again on Twitter, mm -hmm. um, uh, targeted the Freedom Caucus yeah. and said basically didn't just blame them for killing the Obamacare replacement, but said then he's going to target them in uh, in their campaigns. That was pretty extraordinary. It was extraordinary, of course, and they're cowering in their districts. Except, oh wait, they're not actually. <laughs> they don't seem at all worried. They came back and pushed right back on him with very Trumpian type tweets of their own, saying, you know, hey, we're out here trying to drain the swamp. What happened to you? 
and because they're in districts where they do feel safe and they have found their own polls show that the health care replacement bill that they oppose was not any more uh, popular in their own districts among their own Republican constituents than Obamacare. So they feel quite secure. And the, the consequence of that is interesting. Just two and a half months into this presidency, he's already uh, finding people willing to stand up against him in his own party. They're not afraid of him. You want to have a little fear as a president among your own party that they would not want to cross you. They don't seem to fear him. Michael, on Peter's point, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the president came to office in part by saying, I'm not going to be a capitulator, a Washington right. weak need, agree to anything, <laughs> having to deal with these silly legislative rules that you pay attention to. We're going to mm -hmm. stand on principle and we're not going to cave. Well, isn't that exactly what the Freedom Caucus is doing? And I mean, they're they're doing what they said they were going to do. Yeah, you know, it is bizarre because Donald Trump is not a conservative. He's not a Freedom Caucus guy. That was never going to be his team. And when he tweeted out, we've got to take on the Freedom Caucus and the Democrats, who does that leave? Mm -hmm. The evil establishment. That's all they have left. And I think the Freedom Caucus is worried they're going to lose this president to something else. Uh, Mark Meadows was at our office this week and he said, you know, we want everyone to know, Mr. President, we love you. And we say more good things about you in our caucus than anyone else does. But if, if the Freedom Caucus has no leverage in the White House, that's a problem for them. But if Donald Trump doesn't have the Freedom Caucus in his coalition, who does he replace him with? This has not happened very often. <laughs> I, I think I had to go all the way back to FDR in 1938, targeting those who didn't support the, the New Deal enough to find a president who actively says, I'm going to go bring people, put people up against you in your primaries or in your campaigns to people in his own party. That's right. And publicly. Right. So, you know, you might have had LBJ th being threatening to someone as he as he twisted arms behind the scenes. But this is this is quite extraordinary. And one more sign of how you say Trump, Trump is not a conservative. He's not really a Republican in many ways. And we saw that play out in the health care debate where Trump's agenda and Trump's supporters we're different from from Ryan. Ryan is a traditional. Let's be. Let's have a smaller government kind of conservative. Trump would be happy, I think, with a larger health care bill that takes care of some of the older voters, some of the Democratic leaning voters in the upper Midwest who voted for him. And that is a bigger government that Ryan's unhappy with. But to do that, he would need to form a real coalition, a real bipartisan coalition with Democrats. And I can tell you, there is zero sentiment on the Democratic side to cooperate with Donald Trump, which we're going to see this week in the Supreme Court. In the vote. Supreme Court, which we'll get to in a minute. But, uh, David, a question to you as the president tries to get back on track after, after health care. There's some debate about what, what the status is of health care. But one of the ways he could get back on track is if he had a full team on the field. Mm -hmm. uh, I keep hearing from the State Department, from the Department of Defense, that all of these uh, other these positions don't have people filled, and it's not the Senate's fault. They haven't had nominees put forward. What it, kind of it's very is difficult for these big bureaucracies to, to operate effectively with so few key people uh, in positions. This uh, administration rollout really is uh, delayed uh, in a way that, that's hurting. Just on this on this question of going after the, the Freedom Caucus, the the far right in the, in the in the House Republican Caucus has essentially paralyzed that party now for uh, years. John Boehner couldn't deal with it and uh, Trump confronts the same problem. And I actually think that there's something to be said for the president, the leader of the party, who says, I'm not going to allow you to paralyze our agenda. We need to be a governing party and you stand in the way of that. So I, I, I don't know if he can't deliver on this. He just looks like, like, a, like, a, like a blowhard. But, but the idea that he take them on, I don't think that's a crazy idea. Well, but the but problem the pro is, as Michael said, sorry, but the problem, as Michael said, is that then, you know, the natural uh, progression would be to move a little more toward the middle and work with Democrats. As Michael said, he's attacking them at the same time. And as Susan said, the Democrats have no interest you in working. You can't do them both. And yeah. as Susan said, who's the first Democrat who's going to say, uh, <laughs> Mr. President, I'm ready to work with you? It's hard I to also, imagine Mike, that. Michael, to your, but build on this, which is there were also Republicans who are not of the Freedom Caucus who didn't like the American Health Care sure. Act. And so, uh, in fact, some would argue there are even more of those who were the problem. Well, no doubt about it. Moderates didn't get on board either. But why should they when they didn't? I think they saw that this was not going to pass. I think we should kind of look at this as a one off. Ryan didn't have his team in place and that's it. And what Ryan really needs is a win because Trump likes winners, yeah. period. Look, Trump would have signed the everybody gets a unicorn bill if they had brought it and it had the votes. He wants to win. That's not up until July. But there is, <laughs> there is not going to be a Democrat 
at a White House signing ceremony by Trump's shoulder signing any kind of health care, care bill of any kind, at least under the current climate. They're not going to do it. He can't work with Democrats. He has to go to the Freedom Caucus. He's got nowhere else for the votes. Susan, back to the Supreme Court that you raised earlier. What's going to happen in the Senate and what does it mean? Well, we're going to see it play out this week as, as Senator Cornyn was describing to you. We're going to have the committee vote on Monday. We're going to have a final vote on the floor on Friday and it's going to be one where they have exploded the nuclear option. It doesn't look like the Republicans will be able to get the eight Democrats they need to uh, force cloture, to force it to a final vote. So Mitch McConnell, has, the Senate Republican leader, has made it clear that he will uh, support a change in the rules, so you only need 51 votes to confirm. John Cornyn was making the point that this is not that big a deal, but I do think it is one more thing that tears at a kind of bipartisan fabric that Washington has operated on for many years. It's one more sign that even on a Supreme Court nomination, we are a 51-49 partisan nation that cannot find any middle ground. Yeah, yeah I, I think one thing we're watching is, is the Democrats feeling they need to play to their base. Uh, Neil Gorsuch is a likable person. Uh, he's very conservative, but it's easy to imagine him as, as a justice. Democrats feel that the base is aroused and they, they, they need this is payback time. You did this to Garland. So I, I, I think uh, you know, the Democrats could take, make a different choice, play to the middle, a um, uh, whole different set of, of priorities, but that's not what we're seeing. All right, David, last word to you. Thanks to all of you for being with us. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment to take a look at President Trump's favorite president. President Trump has shown a strong affinity for the nation's seventh president, Andrew Jackson, perhaps because they were both elected on a platform of challenging the establishment and taking on the Washington elites. Even though they were elected 188 years apart, for some insight on the parallels between the two presidents, we're joined by John Meacham, who won the Pulitzer Prize for his biography of Andrew Jackson, American Lion. Welcome, John. Um, the president really is fond of, of uh, President Jackson. Where do you uh, look, how do you look at the parallels between the two? Well, you know, presidents look back for inspiration, but more often for sanction. Uh, they want to be able to say that this is a, a verse and a hymn that's uh, been, been sung before. And uh, so what, what I think President Trump, as the most unconventional president in our history, uh, which I think he would embrace, uh, is looking for is some historical parallel that I think grounds him to some extent in the experience of the country. And uh, actually it was Steve Bannon who put Andrew Jackson in the conversation right. after the election. Right. Uh, and my own sense is that Jackson was a rabble rouser. He fought duels. Uh, but one of the things about Jackson is he always fired the second shot. Uh, it was often observed of him, you know, once he was in a duel uh, over his wife and he let the other man shoot him, his boot fills with blood, but then he shoots the other man dead. He always waited for the second chance. And I think that temperamental characteristic of waiting for the right opportunity is something that we just haven't seen this president do. So not a counter puncher, but having restraint and yes, doing it second. Exactly. Um, on this, uh, when President Trump has compared himself to President Jackson, uh, and sanction is uh, the perfect way to frame it, he has, has connected himself with the upset that Jackson right. um, created with elites. He is right about that. I mean, in terms of shaking the window panes in Washington. Of the but to paraphrase Hamlet, context is all. Uh, the first six presidents of the United States were either Virginia planters or Adamses from Massachusetts. And so Jackson comes from the lowest rungs of white society. He opens up democratic possibilities, lowercase d, for white people, white men of his type. Uh, but he had been a lawyer, a prosecutor, a judge, a senator, briefly the governor of Florida. Rachel hated the mosquitoes, so he moved back to Tennessee. Uh, he had run for president in 1824. He had accepted the result, though he had won the popular vote. He, he did not win the, plurality, uh, the electoral vote. And then he ran in 1828. So he was an experienced, and he was a general, right. obviously. So he was an experienced figure. Uh, he wanted to shake up things. Uh, he believed that was his platform. He believed that he was the, and he was the first president to put it this way, that he was the only directly elected representative of all the American people. And so all this does begin to sound, as Mark Twain once said, or reputed to have said, <laughs> that history may not repeat itself, but it does rhyme. 
but he he had an experience. He had governmental experience. He understood that. And I really think what's critical in, in my mind is, and we haven't seen this with President Trump yet, is does he understand how to use his own weaknesses? Can he make his vices virtues? Jackson knew that the world thought he was a crazy man. Uh, so once a, a delegation came to the White House uh, during the bank crisis, they wanted relief, and he starts pounding on the table and he says, there's no money here, uh, I'll t hang you all. They all run out of the room. As the door shuts, he turns to his chief of staff and he says, didn't I manage them well? He knew how to use those weaknesses to become strengths. We just haven't seen that with President Trump. And what about Jackson's sense of himself? I was struck when, when Steve Bannon, the president's top aides, talked about Jackson. If you look at Jackson's inaugural address, Bannon did this around the inaugural address, right. Jackson fit himself in the constraints of the office. I mean, he recognized limitations, that restraint you were talking about. He was a Jeffersonian, uh, he wanted to be a Jeffersonian Republican. The key thing about Jackson is he, he was complicit in two of the great original sins in American life, African-American slavery, Native American removal. But on both those issues, we can't put the whole weight of that on Jackson because they were the nation's sins. And he may have been on the extreme edge of the mainstream, but he was still within the mainstream. To me, the great lesson of Jackson is that he believed in the Union. He believed his mother and his brothers had died during the Revolution. He'd been a prisoner of war as a young teenager during the Revolution. He really believed that his family's blood, in many ways, had sanctified the Union had made it sacred. And he referred to us as one great family. He believed that we should, we would have to fight. Democracy was like that. The point of democracy was to disagree. Right. But it was to be within one family. And he, to that end, I believe he had a broader vision of American unity than President Trump has demonstrated yet. One hopes that President Trump, in, in studying, looking at this, he will, he will do so. Uh, and not just take the parts of Jackson that are convenient to him, which is the kind who didn't like the press, although that doesn't separate him from many presidents, right. does it? Exactly. Uh, and, uh, and the tough guy. Jackson was a tough guy, but he was tough in the service of, in a, in a very shrewd and strategic way most of the time. We're, we have not yet seen whether this president can be shrewd and strategic. We have about 20 seconds left. What, what advice would Jackson give this president in terms of if he were to come back through the mists? Fire the second shot. Don't pick so many fights. Pick ones you think you can win. And lead the whole country. Because you become greater the more, follow, the more people you attract. Don't just lead your base, because that base is, is, is already with you. Expand it. Lead the country. Lead that great family. All right, John Meacham, thanks for taking us back to the 18th century and tying it to today. We really appreciate it. And stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. That's it for us today after another busy week. Thanks so much for watching. Until next week, for Face the Nation, I'm John Dickerson.